Sorry. <laughs> right, hold on. Um, right. Right. Good evening, everyone, and Good welcome evening. to another CAS webinar. Tonight we have space news from Roy Bryce. Then our main speaker for this evening is Mike Frost, director of the BAA Historical Section, whose presentation is entitled Reverend George Fisher, Arctic Astronomer. Our next webinar is on the 28th of February, and the speaker is Gordon Jury, whose presentation is entitled The Secrets of Starlight, the History and Physics of Spectroscopy. <clears throat> now, can I just just um, say to everybody as well, because I think when uh, Robert Jr., you emailed me about no getting a link, and Graham did as well, and I think the problem was that um, I realised after it, I had uh, forgotten when I'm doing the BCC bit, I forgot to put, I thought I had put down cast members, but I, I must know I done because I'd emailed it to everybody else. Uh, so if you don't receive the email before like the Thursday or or even the Friday at the latest, the the week before the actual meeting, can you alert me so that I can I can send it round again? Because yeah, doing it on the Monday, it's because uh, I've got Spanish on the Monday, so I'm doing my my practice beforehand and I've got Spanish from like five o'clock to six thirty and then then the the meeting so and I switched my emails off during Spanish so as that uh, I don't hear the ping 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 emails you know all right just uh, just to let you know because uh, I don't I check my emails every day but it's just that uh, with me and my foggy medicated brain I forget so if, we don't it, if we don't receive it by when? Well, so Thursday, in the week before the meeting, because I always send it out um, on the Sunday or the Monday, the week before the meeting. So if you don't get it yeah. by the Thursday or whatever, or you should get it the next day or the Tuesday or whatever. If you don't receive it, you know, let me know by the Thursday at the late so that I can resend it. You know, so yeah. as I'm no in a rush, try to get it sent. You know, between Spanish class and the the meeting. Yeah, because that happened once before. I would aye, get aye, okay. aye. It's only happened twice, but it's just with my brain and with all my coursework and everything. It it it, it just got <coughs> it okay. just got a bit confused. Right now, it's over to Roy for space news. Yes. Do the usual share the screen thing. So can you see the slide correctly for Neptune? Yep. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, can you hear me okay as well, yeah? Uranus and Neptune are similar planets in many ways. Both are ice giant worlds, both have yeah. atmospheres rich in methane, and both have a bluish color. But while Uranus has a pale blue-green hue, Neptune has a deep blue color. But why? Why would two planets so similar in size and composition appear so different? According to a recent study, the answer lies in their aerosols. Aerosols are small dust particles or droplets of liquid that are suspended within a gas. On Earth, we often think of aerosols as a form of pollution, since smoke and smog are aerosols. But aerosols can also be less harmful things, such as the mist of a fog, or a cloud of tiny ice crystals on a cold winter's night. If you've got an atmosphere, you're bound to have aerosols. Aerosol particles can be so small that diameters are roughly the same is the wavelengths of visible light. Because of this, the way light scatters off them can depend on the light's wavelength. Through a process known as me scattering, long red wavelengths usually scatter more than shorter blue ones. Me scattering is why Mars often has a tan sky rather than a blue one, 
and why sunsets on Mars are often blue. As this latest study shows, aerosols play a significant role in the colouring of Uranus and Neptune, but the connection is not really a simple one. The atmospheres of Uranus and Neptune are mostly hydrogen and helium, but they're also rich in methane. Methane absorbs red light and reflects blue, which is why both planets have a generally blue colour. There's traces of other elements in the atmosphere, and the chemical reactions between various molecules can create a haze of aerosols that can taint their basic blue hue. Based on spectral observations of Uranus and Neptune, the team devised a model where there are three main types of aerosols, numbered by how deep they are located within the planet's atmosphere. The deepest layer is aerosol 1, which seems to be a combination of a molecular smog and ice particles of hydrogen sulphide. Hydrogen sulphide reflects green light while absorbing red and blue, which helps give Uranus its greenish tinge. The middle layer, or aerosol 2, doesn't reflect much visible light, but it does reflect ultraviolet and infrared. The highest layer is aerosol 3. It's composed of particles smaller than a micron and tends to reflect visible light about the same at all colours. The aerosol 3 layer is thicker on Uranus, making it appear paler than Neptune. Neptune also has an upper layer of methane ice clouds, helping to maintain its deep blue. This layering of aerosols could also help explain storms in the two planets, such as the great blue spot seen on Neptune as it was visited by Voyager 2. Or Voyager 11, come think of it. As the upper layers are cleared by a storm, the deeper, bluer layer is more easily seen. <coughs> While this unified model of aerosol layers can explain the appearance of both worlds, alternatives can't be ruled out, of course. The team also came up with different models that could explain Uranus and Neptune separately. But the unified model works well and could help explain the atmospheres of icy gas worlds around other stars. While black holes might always be black, they do occasionally emit some intense bursts of light from just outside the event horizon. Previously, what exactly caused these flares had been a mystery to science. That mystery was solved recently by a team of researchers that used a series of supercomputers to model the details of black holes' magnetic fields in far more detail than ever before. The simulations point to the breaking and remaking of super strong magnetic fields as the source of the super bright flares. This limb would suggest it's probably rather like the sun as well. Scientists have known that black holes have powerful magnetic fields surrounding them for some time. Typically, they're just one part of a complex dance of forces, material and other phenomena that exist around a black hole. That complex dance has been notoriously hard to model, even with advanced supercomputers. So trying to understand the details of what's happening around a black hole has proven exceptionally difficult. Stronger computers can handle difficult or more difficult computer problems. And thanks to Moore's law, that's exactly what we've got now with computers. Dr. Bart Reparada, co-lead author of the study and a postdoctoral fellow at the Flatiron Institute in Princeton University, and his colleagues utilize three separate supercomputing clusters to produce the most detailed image of the physics going on outside a black hole event horizon. Magnetic fields, unsurprisingly, played a major role in these physics. But more importantly, they played a critical role in developing flares. Specifically, flares formed when magnetic fields broke apart and joined back together. The magnetic energy unleashed by these processes supercharges photons in the surrounding medium. And some of these photons get ejected straight into the black hole's event horizon, while others get ejected out into space in the form of flares. Simulations showed how the breaking and making of magnetic field connections that were invisible at previously available resolutions. Dr. Riparada and his colleague's image had a thousand times the resolution of any previously available black hole simulation. The most accurate simulations in the world can't make up for an incorrect model, so previous simulations ignored basic features of black hole interactions. With higher resolution came greater understanding. The new simulations accurately modeled how the magnetic field process around the event horizon works. First, the material collected in the accretion disk migrates towards the black hole's pores. Migrating charged material like that is sure to affect magnetic field lines, 
which you tend to move with it. Part of that movement process causes some of the magnetic field lines to break and potentially reconnect with a different field line. In some cases, the pocket material is formed that is insulated from other external forces, but it's eventually shot out towards the black hole itself or the rest of the universe. This is where the flares come from. All these processes are difficult to simulate, even on a cluster of supercomputers. However, most simulations are built to fit the existing data at the best. Collecting data to test these simulations is still a long way off, but you can ensure that someone somewhere is already working on it. You've possibly never seen Mars like this before. Recently, the New York University of Abu Dhabi released an 88-page book of the Red Planet called The Atlas of Mars. The Atlas is free online and uses spectacular imagery taken from the United Emirates Space Agency's ambitious Mars Hope mission. The Atlas was created with data from the Hope probe in an attempt to provide readers with a holistic view of the planet, says New York UAD research scientist Dr. Dimitri Petrie in the preface to the Atlas. The aim is to capture and show how Mars changes during the day across seasons throughout the entirety of the mission. Mars Hope was launched from the Tangishima Space Center in Japan on July the 19th, 2020, and arrived in orbit around Mars on February the 9th, 2021. Mars Hope became the very first interplanetary mission for the fledgling United Arab Emirates Space Agency, which became the sixth nation to successfully reach Mars. This was all part of a banner year for Mars's exploration. As you remember, NASA's Perseverance rover, China's Tiananmen mission, also successfully made their way to the Red Planet in 2021. The mission was very much an international collaboration with the Japanese Aerospace Agency launch carrier, the spacecraft mission control located at the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center in the UAE, and spacecraft construction and support provided by Arizona State University and in the Lab for Atmospheric and Space Physics in Boulder, Colorado. Mars Hope entered a wide-ranging 55-hour, 20,000 by 43,000 kilometer orbit around Mars early last year. Unlike other missions, this vantage point affords the orbiter a full disk view to study climate and weather variations. To this end, Mars Orbiter is equipped with the Emirates Mars Infrared Spectrometer, the Emirates Mars Ultraviolet Spectrometer, and the main multi-band high-resolution camera, the Emirates Exploration Man Imager. I'm going to try and quite hard to make sure you know it came from the Emirates. Uh, if you've had a chance to read the slide, the next one. The eye candy portions of the Atlas were primarily constructed from EXI images, which provide stunning natural vistas of Mars and a thrilling study of the dichotomy of the two opposing hemispheres. One beauty is the full page splash of the enormous Valles Marinaris chasm. The Atlas really gives you the sense of size of the enormous open gash across the surface of the red planet. But there's also some amazing science in the Atlas as well. Towards the second half of the book, we see studies in ultraviolet day glow, daily surface temperatures, and something we generally don't think of when it comes to Mars, its tenuous magnetic field. It's worth checking back to the Atlas as well, because the Mars Hope team intend to plan and update it periodically with new images, creating the first comprehensive high-res study of seasonal changes on Mars. The Atlas ends with a beautiful set of crescent phase images of Mars, full caps and all. These really give you a sense of you are there, hanging in space and gazing upon the red planet in living colour. These are views that human eyes have yet to see in person. I went on and had a look through the main thing, but it is 88 pages long, so this is just a sample of some of the stuff that was on it. It's pretty good. It's worth a look. As we all know, the Space Shuttle was an iconic symbol of spaceflight. For 30 years between 1981 and 2011, this program flew 135 missions, which consisted of orbital science experiments, deploying satellites, launching interplanetary probes, participating in the Shuttle Mir program, deploying the Hubble Space Telescope, and constructing the International Space Station. There were, of course, also tragedies along the way, such as Challenger in 1986 and Columbia in 2003. 
But here's an interesting, at least I hope, a little known fact. I didn't know about it. The actual design of the space shuttle could actually have been entirely different. Rather than the reusable space transportation system, an expendable external tank and the solid rocket boosters that we all remember, there was also a concept for a fully reusable two-stage to orbit space plane, which they were going to call the DC-3. As we tribute to the sort of person who spends a large amount of their time creating a representation of what could have happened in space history, let's watch a lovely video by space flight animator Hayes Grey Art and see what a full takeoff and landing would have looked like had NASA decided to go with this concept instead. Yeah, sorry, I fall.
Certainly, you certainly put quite a lot of work into making that, so I hope you enjoyed it. So, anyway, now that we change the subject. In a new paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a NASA-funded simulation of past Mars has revealed that the red planet was wetter for longer than previously thought, about 500 million years longer. The research into Mars's past conditions wasn't an easy task, as co-author Michael Ray explains. Discerning the climate of Mars approximately 3 billion years ago is challenging because the Martian surface features do not seem to fully support either a warm or wet or cold and dry climate during most of that time. A warm and wet climate would have produced extensive erosion from flowing water, but few valley networks have been observed from that age. And a too cold climate would have kept any northern ocean frozen most of the time. A moderate cold climate would have transferred the water from the ocean to the land in the form of snow or ice. But this would prevent tsunami formation, for which there is some evidence. This new simulation found not only a cold and wet Mars was possible, but there might even have been a stable ocean in the northern hemisphere, where the atmosphere was dense and warm. That would make it possible for the water to evaporate, but then fall back to the surface as rain or snow. In nearby highland regions, the snow would accumulate enough to become glaciers, and these glaciers would flow back down to rejoin the ocean. And that northern ocean means a mechanism for circulating warm water to the North Pole, raising temperatures there as well. Factor in the evidence that Mars's atmosphere was thicker in the past, and you can now keep Mars warm for a longer period of time than was previously thought. A warmer, wetter planet for an extra 500 million years gives you that much more time and the right conditions for life to develop. The evidence is piling up for a habitable past Mars, and it's exciting to contemplate what future rock samples might find once we get them back. One of the really pleasing things about astronomy is how pretty the data can be. A lot of times, a research project will start out with a person or a team taking on the newest, highest resolution, longest exposure image of something that's thought to be scientifically interesting. And almost immediately, you can say to yourself, this is going to be gorgeous. And you spend a few days or weeks, depending on the complexity of your setup, getting the best possible version of that image put together. This system is 17 million light years away, which is roughly seven times further than the Andromeda galaxy. The system is rich in young, hot stars that pierce the surroundings with ultraviolet light. This data picks up the red nebulosity of surrounding hydrogen gas glowing red under the ultraviolet light. According to the release that came with this image, astronomers aim to discover thousands of emission nebulae, regions created when hot young stars bathe the clouds of gas surrounding them in ultraviolet light, causing them to glow. Until that research comes out, we have this pretty picture to keep us going. As I've just said, for this space news, sometimes it's just fun to look at pretty pictures. So now we're going to look from a pretty galaxy to a pretty new view of Saturn. This image was built up from infrared data acquired by the Keck Telescope in Hawaii, and it shows how Saturn's south pole can be ringed with strong aurora. Using a month's worth of data, researchers were able to map circulation patterns in Saturn's atmosphere that reveal the aurora are driven by atmospheric winds and generate radio emission pulses that have made the measurement of Saturn's rotation rate harder than it should have been. Radio pulses actually make Saturn look like it rotates with a variable length day, but it doesn't. It just has variable winds that generate changing aurora. This kind of aurora is very different from that we have on Earth. Actually, it matches early explanations of Earth's aurora. According to the study author Tom Stallard, this search for a new type of aurora harks back to some of the earliest theories about Earth's aurora. We now know that aurora and Earth are powered by interactions with a stream of charged particles driven by the sun. But I love the fact that the name aurora borealis actually originates from the dawn of the northern wind. These observations have revealed that Saturn has a true aurora borealis, the first ever aurora actually driven by winds in the atmosphere of a planet. And here's another pretty picture. NASA's Parker Solar Probe was built to study the sun but it needs to use the gravity of the inner planets to shift its orbit closer and closer to our star. During a recent flyby, 
Park returned its infrared instruments on Venus. And astronomers were surprised to see they could actually see all the way through to the planet's surface beneath its thick clouds and atmosphere. During the flyby, the spacecraft saw the dark tinted shape of Aphrodite Terra, a highland near Venus's equator. And as always, thanks very much to the Cosmo Quest and Universe Today people for the podcast and the newsletter that gives me the up-to-date information that I use to compile these space news. And that's the space news for tonight, so back to Alice Amanda. Right, that was interesting, yeah. Good. Aye, because did you see about <coughs> the, the volcanic eruption of Mount Etna? Ah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, it's been a, a big, big one. Aye, spectacular, because one, the southern side of the crater has risen 100 feet yeah. higher than, than the other side. Yeah, the, the height of the plume of volcano that came out is something, something about Aye. 800 meters or something incredible. Aye. Yeah. Oh, and you've seen the light. I mean, I know lightning's common within um, volca- volcanic eruptions and that, but you saw the images and that. They were spectacular <laughs> images. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was uh, fantastic. Right. Um, Mike is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. He's founder and member of the Society for the History of Astronomy. And he's the director of the British Astronomical Association's historical section. He gives talks to astronomical societies and others around the country. If there is one good thing to have come out of Zoom era, it's the opportunity to lecture to new astronomical societies a little further from home. The furthest he says so far is the Sydney Sky Watchers. Wow. He is useless, he says, as an observational astronomer, but has someone man- has somehow managed to get to 13 total solar eclipses. Most recently, the December 2020 eclipse mid-pandemic in Patagonia, the December 2021 Antarctic eclipse, however, was beyond his budget. So he has great admiration for those who ventured to do astronomy from near the poles in years gone by. So let's show Mike our usual Kaz warm welcome. Thank you very much, Alice Amanda. It's a pleasure, pleasure to talk to you. As I say, it's, it is, has been a, a, a small consolation of the Zoom era that I can, uh, I can talk to all sorts of new societies are, are around the country. Um, I, I, as I said in, my, in the introduction I gave to Alice, that, Alice Amanda, that I, um, I um, talk about um, local astronomers. So let me, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm an astronomical historian and I specialize in local astronomers. I'm just trying to get to uh, share. So if I share that, you should see screen now. So if I do, text. yeah, if I, from, from, from beginning. Oh. Okay, so uh, I, I specialize in, uh, in this the subject of my study tends to be people who've done astronomy or uh, have some connection uh, to, to the area close to where I live, which is in Rugby, uh, right in the middle of England. Uh, and the, kind of the reason for that is it, it's nice and easy to, uh, to travel, uh, to, uh, to do the research. I don't have to go very far to find out uh, about them. But also uh, that you, uh, when you we start giving talks to, to uh, 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 people around here, uh, you get a bit of a reputation that uh, you're, uh, you're known as uh, an astronomical historian and people come up and, and tell you things. And, uh, and so you get new leads cropping up all the time of, uh, of new people to, to start researching. And this is indeed the case with the Reverend George Fisher. That's the portrait of him here. Um, and uh, in this case, it, it uh, was um, back in uh, April 2016 uh, when I gave a talk to uh, Market Harbour Historical Society that I first found out about Reverend George Fisher. Uh, market Harbour, uh, if you if you don't know my part of the world, is a little market town in the south of Leicestershire, which is about 15 miles to the northeast of where I live in in Rugby. And about halfway between the two is the little village of South Kilworth. Uh, and in the Victorian era, between about 1820 and 1850, the rector of South Kilworth, uh, Reverend William Pearson, uh, was an observational astronomer. He had two observatories in the village. 
I gave a talk all about him. Uh, and amongst other things, he was the co-founder of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, and uh, in 2020, the, the picture you see there, uh, 200 years and four days after the foundation of the Royal Astronomical Society, we put up a plaque to him in, 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 on the gates of the rectory in South Kilworth. A wonderful day, a, a great day, a blustery January day, but we all had a lot of fun. And it was just as the pandemic was beginning. So you look back on it with the fond memories, no social distancing, uh, just, just a bunch of people having, having a good time and doing some astronomy at the same time. Anyway, I gave a talk to Market Harbour Historical Society about Reverend Pearson, same talk that I gave to astronomy societies, uh, and they they, uh, they, they did enjoy it, I think. Um, I, I find that local history societies do appreciate talks uh, on, on, on uh, people with specialist, uh, specialist interests, as it were, from people who understand what they were doing. Uh, uh, they may know that there was an astronomer in South Kilworth, but they weren't very sure what he was doing. So having a, a, an astronomical historian come along and tell them what his story was uh, is, is much appreciated by them. Anyway, so I'm talking about Reverend William Pearson to Market Harbour and uh, Historical Society. And at the end of the meeting, a chap called Bob Hayquill uh, came up to me. He's known in Market Harbour as the History Man. That's on his business card. Uh, and he's, he's a local historian who found out all about the history of Market Harbour. And he was very keen to tell me about another local astronomer, uh, the Reverend Fisher. Uh, and I was only too, very keen to, to, to find out from him because, as I say, the people do come along and give me, uh, give me leads to investigate. Uh, and uh, what he said was that, uh, uh, that uh, Reverend Fisher was, from, uh, uh, was, uh, was connected to Market Harbour, that he was, uh, he, he, uh, he, he was buried there. Then the, I'll show you the church and the plaque uh, later on. But, but he said, actually, he didn't live in Market Harbour at the time. He lived in rugby. Uh, and he didn't know I was from rugby. So I was, uh, there's an added bonus that actually not only was he from uh, not only were there any connections to the next stand along but he had connections to rugby itself and so uh, buried him little little boat in market harbour but actually living in rugby at the time uh, uh, around about the time of his death and uh, this was where he lived in rugby this rather elegant terrace uh, terrace uh, in the uh, it, it, it's about a quarter of a mile or so from the centre of rugby, just opposite rugby school, which may be of some significance. We'll we'll see we'll see later on. Second from left, very uh, uh, the Victorian era house, obviously, because he lived there in the Victorian era. But uh, it, it's uh, one one of the better houses. Certainly, certainly more rather rather better than the, the place where I live. More impressive. Uh, and uh, where my friends from the local history group in rugby uh, in uh, uncovered the, uh, the 1871 census, so we know the inhabitants. Of that uh, of that uh, uh, address on uh, the uh, uh, when the census was taken, there were five people living there. Re uh, George Fisher, uh, seventy seven years of age, uh, a retired chaplain from the Royal Navy, and his daughter Alice, uh, one of his two daughters, uh, and we'll find out a little bit more about Alice later on. Uh, a quite surprising character in her own right, and then uh, three servants: uh, Hester Hill, the cook, and then the two uh, the two servants: Elizabeth Malin from Rugby itself and Sarah Rowley uh, from uh, uh, from Pickleton in Leicestershire. So the three servants were all local, but you can see that uh, George himself and Alice uh, were not from originally from uh, from Warwickshire, from uh, from Rugby. And this posed quite an interesting question is, uh, uh, does he really count as a local astronomer in that uh, he wasn't, uh, uh, I have to, I've, as you'll see, I've done my level best to try and prove that he actually did some astronomy from, from rugby, but I'm not sure I've done so conclusively. Uh, uh, to what extent does he therefore count as a rugby astronomer? Uh, and I'll kind of, this is a, a dilemma that has occupied me a few times. So I'll give you a couple of examples of people who I, uh, who I could claim as rugby astronomers, but I'm not absolutely convinced. For example, at the 14th Astronomer Royal, Sir Arnold Wolfendale. I met him, he's done no long with us, he unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. But when I did meet him at a, a meeting of the Society of History of Astronomy uh, about 15 years or so ago, and he discovered I was from rugby, he was most keen to tell me that that was where he was born. I was very surprised to hear this. Um, you know, there've only been 15 Astronomers Royal in, in, in England, uh, a few more in Scotland, of course, uh, but of those 15, one of them was born in rugby, which is great. However, he left rugby when he was about six months old and never had any further connections to the town. So to what point to, 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 
to how much we can claim as a rugby astronomer. Well, I, I, I think we're pushing it a lot to be able to say so. Uh, and then there's Paul Dirac. Well, he wasn't even an astronomer, but he was a very important, possibly the most significant British physicist of the 20th century. He was the guy who discovered antimatter. Uh, he's from a Bristol originally, despite the, the French sounding name. He was he was he had a pronounced West Country accent uh, uh, and he had a domineering father who insisted that uh, even though he wanted to be a physicist, knew he was going to be a physicist, insisted he did electrical engineering as his first degree. And so he was a vacation student in rugby. He spent a, a, a summer working at British Thompson Houston in rugby. Uh, he absolutely hated it. Um, he didn't like it at all here. Uh, his biographer, Graham Fellows, an excellent biography of Paul Dirac. I'll read it if you get the chance. The Strangest Man. I think Dirac was a, was a very peculiar character. And, and whilst he was in rugby, he spoke to almost nobody. He spent uh, a, 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 nobody who, uh, who he didn't have to speak to. He wouldn't. He spent all his time in the library reading physics journals that he'd ordered on interlibrary loan schemes. So I don't think we can claim Paul Dirac as a rugby physicist. I don't think we can claim Arnold Wolfendale as a rugby astronomer. Um, and uh, 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 Reverend Fisher, well, he spent 10 years living in rugby, but they weren't the most productive years of his astronomical life. Nonetheless, when I find out more about his story, well, it's such an interesting one that I am going to claim him as a, as a rugby astronomy for the purposes of this talk. But as I say, he's not originally from the Midlands. He was born in Sunbury on Thames in Middlesex just to the south of the Thames, to the west of London, to, in uh, October 1794. Uh, and he came from quite a wealthy family originally. His father was the architect surveyor for Hanover Square in London, a very elegant square in, in the West End. It was residential in, the, in its day. I think it must have been a lovely place to live. But it's now offices. Uh, but of course, you all know that because it's the offices of, uh, of Vogue, which you all frequent, you know, the, as, uh, very being stylish and fashionable. Um, and um, uh, it's so um, uh, he, unfortunately, his father died in 1797 when he was uh, in his third year. Uh, and I think uh, the circumstances not put through him into penury, uh, but uh, his mother had to bring up George and his two, uh, two or possibly three brothers, and there may, may have been one who died young. Uh, and so uh, instead of the, uh, the, the normal uh, privileged education he might have had, gone to Eton or, or something like that, actually in uh, 1808, the age of 14, he joined the Westminster Fire Company. Uh, these is actually it's, it's, it's fascinating the things you find out about when you, like, you you start learning about the history is that the fire company was an insurance company with its own fire brigade. Uh, well, why didn't they use the, 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 the proper fire brigade? And so because there wasn't a national fire brigade service at this time. So if you lived in somewhere in London or if you worked in somewhere in London, the offices, if there was a fire, uh, nobody was going to come and fix it until unless you paid for it. Uh, there were private fire companies who'd come along and haggle with you as your building burned down. Uh, but there were also people who, uh, you, with whom you would have a contract to, uh, uh, to say, if there's a fire, uh, you come around. And essentially, what they bring is, well, they bring a fire engine, so they try and put the fire out. But they'd also bring porters, whose job was to get the stuff, the import stuff out of the building as quickly as possible in case it really did burn to the ground. So uh, I, I, it's not clear just exactly what George's job was, or whether or not he was administrative, just clerical, or whether or not he was actually part of the fire company. Company. However, we do know there must have been some sort of connection because he got a medal for it. Um, there are actually two medals there. Uh, you can see uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, on the left and the right uh, is the Westminster Fire Office Medal. Uh, Mr. George Fisher elected 1809 to it. I'll tell you about the one in the middle, which is significantly more important. But nonetheless, you know, to, to actually have a medal from the Fire Office in, in 1809, that doesn't suggest that they give that to the, the, the guy who makes the tea. Uh, I'm rather hoping it's because he was part of the fire brigade who put out the fires. Not absolutely certain. I, I would say a big thank you at this point to George Marty Stein, fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, polar historian, who, uh, who's found out, uh, who, who wrote a fascinating paper uh, uh, about, about Fisher. Uh, I, I concentrated more in my research is on his astronomical activities. Uh, uh, George uh, uh, Marty Stein actually uh, more on his, his polar, uh, polar expeditions. So uh, uh, between the two of us, we've hopefully covered his uh, his story uh, uh, quite uh, comprehensively so i'll come back to the to the middle medal in, in a little while so he started, first of all, he started in quite privileged, and then his father died, and so he had to make his own way in life to a certain extent, but he did so very successfully, to the extent that he found himself 
in St. Catherine's College in Cambridge a few years later. His strong mathematical and scientific tastes had already declared themselves, even at the insurance company, even as a clerk and fireman, he was actually doing proper mathematics, proper astronomy, actually scientific activities. Uh, and the people, uh, it, it, it's quite noticeable that the names of Sir Joseph Banks, Sir Humphrey Davy, Sir Everard Home, with Met Hume, with many others, were always gratefully mentioned by him. Uh, it says a portion of his life that I, neither I nor uh, the Glenn Stein, the Marty Stein, know very much about. Uh, somehow or other, he managed to get himself from the insurance company into the uh, the auspices of the Royal Society uh, that uh, and, and meet these famous people from the from the the great days of the Royal Society and the uh, and the Royal Institution. Uh, somehow, uh, presumably, he must have gone along to lectures and asked the right questions and gradually got noticed as a as a as a young fellow lad in his uh, late teens, early twenties, uh, uh, to get himself noticed and uh, and be uh, uh, be of uh, uh, of significance to them. And say he ended up getting himself a, a place at St. Catherine's College in Cambridge. Uh, but uh, his was an unusual, his, his is never a life that uh, that took a regular course, you know, for, for, first of all to the fire brigade uh, and then to St. Catherine's College, Cambridge. But even as an undergraduate, he joined his first polar expedition, he joined an expedition led by Captain David Buchan to try to sail across the Arctic Ocean. Of course, at this point, we hadn't, uh, we hadn't, uh, we had no idea what was at the pole because we never got that far north. And so the received wisdom was that there was an Arctic Ocean that was potentially sailable. And of course, we know that that is, uh, well, First of all, if you read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea uh, by Jules Verne, written uh, many years later, actually, than that, uh, uh, the Nautilus visits the South Pole, which is in the middle of, a, of an ocean. It's actually got an island there with trees on it. Uh, and uh, so that gives you some idea that uh, people just simply didn't appreciate just how cold the poles were. Uh, it, uh, in, this, in the case of the, of the North Pole, of course, it is in an, in, in an ocean, an Arctic Ocean, but it is in one that is permanently frozen. So actually, Sailing there is uh, it requires uh, icebreakers of uh, considerably more power and uh, and uh, and uh, and heft, shall we say, than uh, than what was available the wooden sailing ships of the time. So it was not a, an expedition that was ever going to succeed. It was simply a matter of, of where they gave up. And so these were the two boats, the Dorothea and the Trent, uh, and they didn't actually get that far. There was a. a, a, a Terrible storm to the north of Spitsbergen, the largest island of the, the Svalbard archipelago, uh, the furthest north that, uh, of, of civilization at the time, and pretty much then and now. Uh, but uh, uh, so it wasn't an expedition that got too much further than had gone before. Uh, but Fisher came out of it pretty well, is that what, amongst the things he managed to do, he managed to take various uh, scientific readings and so on. And he also managed to measure a line of latitude. Uh, this is, a, this is an, a, 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 an endeavor that was being done throughout the back end of the, uh, the 18th century and into the 19th century, was to try and measure the lengths of lines of latitude around the world. And you might say, well, why would they want to do that? They'd all be the same because the Earth is a sphere. But it's not, of course, it's not quite spherical. Uh, the, uh, the, the predictions from uh, Isaac Newton's theory of gravity was that actually the, the sort of the centrifugal force, as it would, would throw the Earth out at the equator. And so it would be a, a spheroidal, uh, uh, longer around the equator than, than around the poles. Uh, and this was, the, uh, this was not known whether or not this was correct. And so uh, various people on various expeditions around the world measured the length of lines of latitude. Mason and Dixon, for example, actually, uh, I, I give a talk on Mason and Dixon and uh, they uh, they spent as long measuring the line of latitude north south as they did measuring the the famous Mason Dixon line from east to west. So a lot of people did it. George uh, 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 the Reverend Fisher did it, and uh, and his, it was noted that he succeeded in doing this in what was otherwise a not tremendously successful uh, expedition. So. He took his degree, although he was hampered by illness. Uh, again, this, I find this quite fascinating. It's hampered, illness hampered his degree, but didn't stop him doing Arctic expeditions. So I think he was a man made of quite stern stuff. I didn't let these things get in the way. Uh, pretty much the same time as he took his degree, he was ordained. And, uh, and, and unlike many, many, uh, uh, many people uh, in the Victorian era, he combined a career in, uh, in, uh, in science with, uh, with, with a career in the church. 
uh, but in, uh, in, in Fisher's case, he joined the Royal Navy as a chaplain uh, uh, because he'd, uh, he'd, he'd already been on one of the expeditions so, uh, to, uh, beyond Spitsbergen. And he's recruited to join the 1821 Polar Expedition. No, no messing around, pretty much immediately, Polar Expedition organized by this chap, chap here, very handsome handsome guy uh, posing for the, uh, for the portrait. Uh, rather later picture of him, uh, the Sir Edmund, well, sorry, Sir William Edward Parry, 1790 to 19, 1855. So only a year or two older than, uh, uh, than uh, the George Fisher himself. He, uh, he uh, were English admiral and explorer. Uh, I'll, I'll read the citation here. He accompanied Sir John Ross's expedition for discovery of the Northwest Passage and commanded an expedition himself in 1819. So he'd already done a, uh, a, a he'd already been on two ex expeditions by 1821, one, one as part of the team and one uh, under his own command, winning the government prize when he crossed longitude 110 west. His record in reaching latitude 82 degrees 45, 82 and three quarters degrees north was unsurpassed for fi nearly 50 years on on this one. It's quite impressive. It's born at Bath and died at Ems in Germany. And the reason I put this in is that uh, actually this was written or, uh, in, a, in a work by a predecessor of mine, the first ever uh, a, a, a memoir of the historical section of the British Astronomical Association called Who's Who on the Moon, uh, which was edited by my predecessor, the, the first director of the historical section, an amazing woman called Mary Evershed, whom I am in somewhat in awe of. It's rather better than the current idiot who's doing the job. Uh, so Mary was a very accomplished historian, very accomplished solar, uh, solar astronomer, uh, a Dante scholar and, and many other things, an extraordinary woman. Anyway, uh, part of what she did was to, was, to, uh, uh, was to compile a list of potted biographies of everybody who has a crater named after them on the moon. Uh, and uh, this was quite a useful thing to do because uh, uh, it, it, things were a little chaotic. Lunar nomenclature was really being standardized uh, through the early part of the, uh, the 20th century. Mary Black, another BAA member, was involved in this very much. And, uh, and Mary Evershed involved in, 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 uh, in producing a very useful document. I refer to it myself quite often as to uh, all the people who've got craters named after them on the moon. And Paris Crater is here near Fra Mauro, on the, obviously on the near side of the moon, although I say, at the time they couldn't have seen it uh, and a uh, picture on the top from the, the the lunar 4 probe and a rather clearer picture from uh, from apollo 16 so uh, parry uh, was um, well he wasn't uh, he, there are connections to to uh, scientific uh, uh, accomplishments by him as we will see but i think he's primarily there as an explorer uh, rather than as a uh, uh, rather than as an astronomer and there were there are explorers on the moon but parry uh, uh, actually has a, a at least one scientific uh, a discovery due to him, which I will tell you about shortly. Uh, these are the boats, the Fury and the Heckler, uh, which uh, which uh, Parry's expedition up to the uh, to the Northwest Passages used. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, the journal of the second voyage for the discovery of a Northwest Passage by the Fury and Heckler under the command of Captain William Edward Parry is available online. I can I can send you the link so you can have a read of it yourself. It's an absolutely fascinating read. It's, a, it's quite long because it is meant as a serious uh, record of the uh, of the of the expedition. Uh, they weren't sure how long it was going to last for, so they took a lot of provisions uh, and they ended up overwintering twice. Uh, first at uh, what they called Winter Island. A very original name for where they'd spend the winter uh, and the various features on the island are named after various people on the boat and there is a Cape Fisher. I think it's the south end of the, the island I, I believe. And then the second winter uh, they wintered at a place called Igloolik which you may not be surprised to learn was a uh, an Eskimo, a, uh, a, um, uh, a, 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 a native uh, inhabitants uh, settlement so they, 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 they moored near to there. Um, and uh, and then uh, well it, uh, spoiler alert they, uh, they in the end uh, they caught scurvy. Uh, it, reading the uh, the expedition log is quite horrifying really. They report uh, one case of it and then two or three more and suddenly everybody's got it. And, and within a case of about a week they've gone from thinking they may spend a third winter uh, a, 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 a third year exploring and then a third over winter to immediately turning around and heading straight for home because they knew the game was up as soon as you got scurvy on board the boats that people weren't going to last much longer. Fascinating and as I say quite horrifying read. 
Um, just in case you want to know where they are, I'm, I'm not sure I'd be able to tell you exactly where the Northwest Passages were. I always thought there was a sort of generic description for the uh, for everything to the north of Canada that's that, that, that's not land, but uh, uh, there is a more specific description to that, which is pretty much the top end of the Hudson Bay. Uh, Hudson Bay had been uh, is named for Henry Hudson, who was uh, over a century previously, uh, and that is obviously there's the further south you go, uh, the more passable it becomes, the less it freezes up. So that area was quite well known but the area to the north was much much less explored and indeed you know, it's pretty much virgin territory for uh, for uh, for Paris expedition uh, and you can see Greenland and, and Baffin Bay to the east which was not part of this expedition you can also see this huge island in between the Canadian mainland and Greenland itself this is Ellesmere Island which is one of the largest islands in the world considerably bigger than Britain uh, but one you may quite possibly may never have heard of uh, partly because it's next door to Greenland, which is, is, is arguably, Australia might consider being larger, the, the, the largest island in the world. And it, it's quite fascinating, these, these huge islands off the top of Canada, Devon Island as well, off to the left, we, uh, is, is, is they're massive islands that we barely know about because they're so far north and so far, uh, so far off the beaten track. But this was the area around which uh, Fisher and, uh, and Parry and, and, and the rest of the boats, the, the, uh, the crews of the two ships, actually, uh, uh, actually explored. Uh, and you can see uh, what they were looking for was a, a way out. Uh, and you can see there is actually a way out of the top of the Northwest Passages, uh, which they, uh, quote, discovered. Uh, and they, it's called, uh, if I just go uh, up there, uh, 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 zooming in a little bit, it's called the Strait of the Fury and Hecla. Uh, and so it was named for the, the, the two boats by Parry. Uh, and at its narrowest, it's only about 20 miles across. And there are islands in the middle of it. So uh, this huge island of Ellesmere, uh, Ellesmere Island is separated from the Canadian mainland by only about uh, 20 miles or so, you know, sort of like the, the, the width of the English Channel. It's that it really almost but not quite part of the Canadian mainland, uh, but it is a separate, uh, a separate island and there is quite a strong channel. And again, slight spoiler alert here is how did they find it? Well, in part, they did a lot of venturing around and surveying and so on. And eventually they noticed there was a strong flowing current. They were sailing into a current. So they were pretty well certain uh, that there was an, out, uh, an, an outlet or an inlet, something flowing into the Northwest Passages that they were determined to find. But the, reason, re the other reason they knew uh, that there was likely to be a strait there, a, 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 a way out of the Northwest Passages, is because the, the, the Inuit had told them it was there. Uh, they were <laughs> to, they were said, to, well, if you go, if you sail three or you know, three, three or four days to the north, you will find this passage. Uh, so, to what extent did they discover it? Um, well, it's a, it, it was a case of uh, you know, don't, don't the locals get any credit for actually telling you what it, it, that it was there? It's like um, David Livingstone discovering Victoria Falls. Well, what about the people who lived there? Didn't they know it was there? Of course they did. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, Parry, Parry's expedition were the first European. Europeans uh, to, uh, to actually discover this area here, but there were already uh, the Inuits or Eskimo, as they were called at the time, natives who, uh, who, who lived in the area and were able, were happy to help them. Uh, as we'll see, they, they, they met and inter intermingled and, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and swapped information. Uh, and uh, what the Inuit said, well, it's quite interesting reading the log, and I'm, I'm not sure just exactly how, uh, how independent an, a, an account it is, but what, they, what was said, Parry said in the log essentially, was that uh, they they had very little sense of direction uh, that uh, and, and I think this was because they're a liminal people they live on the coastline and so everything was not oh you go to the north or you go to the south well it, it, it initially was sort of uh, uh, north and south perhaps but essentially everything was two days walk or three days walk or seven days walk or 20 days walk uh, no sense of what the coastline might do in that case so uh, if they pointed in a direction that was likely to be wrong but that was because they'd had real, no real need of uh, of, of a direction because they went inland so uh, so little it's so difficult to uh, to penetrate inland so uh, they were essentially uh, th thought of things in a linear fashion rather than a sort of two-dimensional fashion so um, it is fascinating to read of the interactions with the with the Eskimo or the, or the Inuit as they call now and there are some uh, fascinating uh, 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 pictures from uh, of them uh, 
uh, this is this chap here uh, appears to be uh, relaxing and and uh, and, uh, and taking his time doing things. But of course, what he's doing is fishing. And uh, when you're fishing, you've got to be as quiet and as still as possible until your fish takes a bite, uh, and then you the haul the thing out. So you're uh, he's actually you know there was as one of their main food sources was uh, was fish out of the the sea. So they dig holes in the ice and do fishing, or they'd uh, they'd find a spot where uh, uh, where either on the on the land by the sea or or uh, where the ice was wasn't going to snap and de deposit them into the into into the into the into the water. Uh, so you get some really neat pictures here. Um, they uh, again, they, if it was if there wasn't natural shelter there, they'd build their own. They cut blocks of ice, put them up as a shield against the wind, and so they could uh, sit there and wait for the wait for the fish to come along. And uh, uh, this was the 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 chief son who was their sort of primary uh, uh, liaison between the the, the Inuit uh, um, uh, people at Iglulik, that they're over that this is the the Inuit's uh, over winter settlement and uh, uh, and the chief son was uh, came to the came to the ships originally and offered trade and barter so they trade food for uh, but anything metallic there's a oh it's a was not uh, uh, was not uh, uh, didn't have a, a particularly large amounts of metal uh, or, or because of well no no chance to actually make and smelt anything so uh, they they were uh, they were very keen to get knives and so on uh, and uh, they they had they, they, the ship's stores were were carefully uh, were carefully traded away as as, as unnecessary un unwanted stuff was traded for for provisions and so on uh, and again it's quite interesting that the the log says that they initially everything was friendly but then uh, uh, then uh, and then various disputes happened and the 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 Inuit the Eskimo were not to be trusted that uh, they'd steal stuff and so on uh, and I suspect if you read the Inuits it, well they, 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 I don't think there was the Inuits left a written account but I suspect the Inuits account of the same thing would probably read much the same way that it all started very well and then the uh, various pilfering by the uh, by these curious visitors from uh, from from far far away on the on the boats that uh, I'm not sure you can read just one side of the story and get the whole the whole uh, 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 the whole view of what was happening um the uh, the women folk and the the kids they wear these curious uh, things they, they remind me of wingsuits uh, they weren't going base diving off the tops of uh, off the tops of mountain obviously they they try and wear dresses the the a dress that was uh, uh, that was warm uh, and uh, plenty of uh, air, trapped plenty of air inside. There'd be seal skins and furs and so on. So they were. Um, I, I, they have to be quite practical uh, clothing because you're in such an extreme environment. So it, it is a fascinating read, uh, and uh, um, and our view of what the Inuit are like, including the name of Eskimo, which is uh, how we, uh, most of us would think of them. It, it comes from these journals, from the the, the likes of Parry's expedition up to the uh, up to the Northwest Passage area. Uh, and so, you know, the great stereotypes of what Eskimo life are like quite often come from journals such as these. So I'm reading, sort of counting off the stereotypes uh, one by one, seeing which ones uh, actually happened and which ones didn't. For example, did they build igloos out of ice? And the answer to that one is most definitely yes. I mean, you couldn't get more igloo than that, could you? That's a, you know, if you had a, 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 a diagram in a, in a ladybird book of, uh, of what life was like in, in the Arctic Circle, they probably use a diagram like that. So it was what their homes looked like. They were used to building houses out of blocks of ice. Uh, and igloo in the in the new language actually means house or home. So igloo lick means kind of our home base for the uh, for 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 the for the Inuit people. Uh, next uh, next great question is: uh, Did they rub noses? Um, and the answer to which is yes, there is. I was very pleased to read the account. Uh, there was a meeting there, and the elders greeted each other by rubbing and rubbing noses with each other, which I think is uh, you know is a quite practical practical way. Where you don't want to take your gloves off because your hands will get cold and you'll get frostbite and so on. Whereas your 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 face is already uncovered, so uh, a, 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 a a way of showing intimacy and uh, and greeting is uh, is by rubbing noses. Uh, did they uh, did they put their grannies out on the ice to die when they got too old? Um, uh, regrettably, unfortunately, this particular story turns out not to be true. Uh, they did look after their uh, their uh, uh, their older people, although this, this, uh, uh, perhaps the story might have originated uh, because they're uh, the uh, the story of them 
uh, of somebody being brought onto the ship for medical attention, uh, who's clearly very ill, and they died. And, and Parry's journal says they were curiously indifferent to the fate, which is quite an interesting phrase to say. And again, I'm not sure how, how true that actually was, but perhaps you know, these this people are living in extreme circumstances that uh, they can't afford to, uh, to, to uh, uh, if they know people are gonna go, then they, they can't afford to grieve too much for them in the, in the conventional sense. But again, I'm not sure uh, I'm not sure how much how much we're actually seeing Parry's view of this. And finally, the big one, the one I was really waiting to see was how many words did they have for snow? And um, I, I was delighted to read that at the end of the journal is a dictionary from uh, from Eskimo into English. So you can imagine I could hardly contain my excitement to, to, as I turned to the word for snow to find out whether or not the Eskimo really did have 50 words for snow, as the uh, uh, as the uh, as um, rumor would have it. Uh, the name of an album by Kate Bush, but uh, you know, 50 words, uh, some very gradations of snow in the same way as uh, where I grew up in Rochdale, there were 50 words for rain. Uh, but um, I, I, unfortunately, when I got to the entry for snow, there was but one word so uh, perhaps Parry uh, thought one word would be quite enough for snow because there's one one word is quite enough in Bath for snow but uh, well, by the time you get up to Igloo Lake you really need to uh, uh, you really need to distinguish the various types of snow I, I, I don't know Scotland somewhere in the middle I guess that uh, how many words you've got for snow uh, in in Scottish I, 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 you can tell me at the end anyway so that's the uh, uh, that, that's uh, that is the, the it, the interactions with the Eskimo community are quite fascinating and the, uh, the, the way that people live on the margins of how you, you, they couldn't possibly exist too much further north, but somehow they managed to, to build a society uh, and uh, one which worked uh, on the borders of the, uh, of the, of the uh, Northwest Passage. So, um, uh, the, the, uh, move on on to his scientific ex uh, his uh, 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 observations and so on. Uh, well, fortunately, there's quite a lot on him here. Uh, and uh, and if you go to the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, one of my favourite places in London, uh, in the Polar Worlds Gallery, there is an exhibition uh, which includes some of his observing apparatus, including his telescope, which is there inside the displaced case. They wouldn't let me go inside and handle it or anything like that. But uh, uh, and then next to it are some of the various instruments that he used. Uh, number two is his uh, is his microscope, the magnetic dip recorder, which you'll see is absolutely crucial to the work that he was doing, and then the chronometers. Uh, so he was he, he was charged to do various things. He was charged to uh, take a look at uh, the, uh, the 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 microscopic, the microbial life that was there up in the, up in the far north. It, they were very interested in the magnetic fields uh, and, and he took lots of measurements of the, of the dip of the magnetic field uh, because that was potentially a way of navigating is by, from, by, by magnetic dips. Uh, there's an absolutely fascinating passage where they describe sailing and suddenly the magnetic dip, dip recorder went absolutely bonkers uh, and they sailed and they sailed back and it repeated it and they sailed back again, repeated itself once more. So there was a big magnetic anomaly somewhere in the middle of the northwest uh, uh, the northwest passages but they sailed over it so uh, whatever it was uh, they couldn't investigate further uh, one of the biggest meteorites ever found which now sits in the Hayden planetarium in new york fell in this part of area uh, in, the, in in the far north of canada so it's possible that the bit we already see in new york may just be a small bit of something larger large lump of iron which is sat at the bottom of the of the northwest passages giving a magnetic anomaly. I, I, I'm, I'm surmising. I, I don't know whether or not to, that's, that's actually the case, but that's what, that's what struck me as I read that particular passage. It is fascinating to read things with the knowledge, you know, 100, 150, 100, uh, 200 years further on. Um, so his, his duties on board the Führer uh, of the Fury were to uh, calculate the latitude and longitude uh, by astronomical methods and by horological methods. Uh, again, the, the, the classic uh, uh, dual methods highlighted by, uh, by the, 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 uh, the uh, Davos Sobel's wonderful book, Longitude. Uh, you, if, if you've got a good telescope and you've got time and it's not cloudy, you can ask, uh, find, figure out what your longitude is by astronomical methods, uh, or you can take a reliable chronometer. Uh, and the best of all is you do both is that uh, you use your uh, uh, astronomical measurements to to uh, to make sure that the clocks are running properly and which what which of your chronometers i think you had about five or six which of them are running fast which of them are running slow and the two the two methods reinforce each other 
is measuring atmospheric refraction, the amount by which light is bent close to the horizon, measuring the magnetic dip for the magnetic latitude. As I was saying, this is very useful for navigational purposes. Uh, they wanted to observation of low temperature effects. So they did various things where they sent flasks down into the water to, to the very coldest, uh, cold at the bottom of the water and so on. Uh, and one find that he noted uh, quite fascinatingly was that they were, uh, that, that, uh, there were trace of liquids in the bottles of gases that he'd sent down. And he quite correctly suggested that actually, perhaps this was the gas turning into liquid in the same way that you know, steam becomes water uh, and, and, then, and then becomes ice. Uh, and uh, this, was, this was actually a few years before Michael Faraday proved the liquefaction of gases in, the, in a series of classic laboratory experiments in the Royal Institution. So Michael Faraday proved it rigorously and scientifically, but it had already been noted by George Fisher in the high Arctic with, with the non-artificial low temperatures that you actually get in the extreme cold here. So he's doing scientific experiments. If you look at his, uh, uh, at his uh, commission from the Royal Society, there's a huge list of things that they want him to investigate, all sorts of things with magnetic and, and uh, uh, micro, uh, microscope experiments and so on. There's a great long list. Uh, uh, but of course, they want him to, to keep an eye on, uh, on astronomical stuff, uh, the Northern Lights, of course, the Aurora Borealis, the, the, the extreme effects that you see, uh, Parhelia, sun dogs, and so on. I'll show you one or two of them in, in, in a little while. Uh, eclipses and, uh, and uh, all the various observations that you might make from, uh, from, an, in a, from an astronomical observatory. And he had his own, uh, own astronomical observatory. They built onto the ice uh, uh, at both the locations. They made slight, some modifications for the second time they built it, including a rather warmer room for the, the astronomer to go and sit in, in between observations, because I think he was uh, feeling the cold a bit first, first time around in his first winter. But just to give you some idea, I mean, there's, uh, there's lots and lots of observations in here, uh, but the, the, the determination of latitude and longitude, well, he's doing the latitude by uh, altitudes of the sun and stars as they cross the southern meridian, as, uh, as they reach the highest point. Uh, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, he's taking uh, these, uh, these observations and then reducing them to where the ship is. So he gets a pretty accurate uh, observation of how far north they are. And you'll notice that's actually not that far north. It's not even inside the Arctic Circle. Uh, I'm not, to, uh, I mean, it's, it's a pretty extreme place to go to, but actually he's not quite, they've not quite crossed the Arctic Circle. I think they did a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit further north as they got towards the Strait of Fury and Hecla. Um, the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, for the longitude they did various ways. Mr. Fisher took twelve observations of Jupiter satellites, uh, the eclipses and the uh, and the transits of Jupiter satellites. They happen. They, it, it's an event that can be seen from all sorts of locations across the Earth's surface, and they all observe it at the same time. You know, Io comes out of the shadow of, of Jupiter. That everybody sees it at the same time in absolute in universal time, but the local time. If you carefully calculate what the local time is you can then figure out how far west or how far east you are or you can do trigonometrical stuff lunar distances from the sun and from stars so you measure the distance of a star from the moon and that will differ from various points on the earth because of the the parallax effect of the the moon is closer to us than the, than the stars are so uh, if you've got careful tables it's uh, mind-bogglingly difficult mathematics of so mind-boggling tedious mathematics but you can do it that way uh, and you make various constructions from these uh, and you'll see that the, the errors in the various methods much bigger for longitude than they are for latitude. And that, that's well known, is that it is easy to calculate how far north or how far south you are. Uh, the, that's a relatively easy calculation. But the longitude, how far west or how far east you are, is something that has uh, uh, well, certainly occupied people through the 18th and 19th century. And they, they came up with all these various ingenious astronomical methods, measuring the, the Jupiter satellites or uh, uh, distance from the moon to the, to the various stars. Or chronometrical uh, is having a, a Harrison chronometer or, or an inferior uh, competitor to try and figure out what the actual time is compared to what the local time is. Um, again, a few of the uh, of the observations. Most of these are reported by Parry, but many of them are made by uh, uh, by Fisher. Uh, the Aurora Borealis, lots and lots of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, observations of the Northern Lights, of course. Uh, arches, pencils of rays. 
beautiful orange color. So they get you know not just green, but you get the, the various other effects. Um, I, I quite like this one that uh, Parry reports. Uh, I found the state of the weather prevented any observation of the eclipse of the sun, which took place this morning. Yes, I've been to eclipses like that. Mr. Fisher could only just perceive the penumbra passing over the ship. So it wasn't a total eclipse, uh, but uh, it was a partial eclipse that he could only just, it, it, and I suspect if he didn't know it was happening, he would have uh, struggled to actually see the eclipse through all the cloud. I love this one about Sirius, the beautiful, most beautiful of violet and blue colors when Sirius uh, is uh, is on the meridian. So Sirius is as high as it gets, but that is not very high uh, from 66 degrees north, virtually uh, virtually just above the horizon. And so you're getting reflection of light. Uh, and uh, we, well, you see this beautiful dartling of Sirius, even from England, the way it shows different colors. Well, I think from further north still, uh, you, you're getting a fantastic separation of the colors of the star. Uh, and the aurora was playing about that time. I thought I'd never seen anything so brilliant. The play of prismatic colours in a cut diamond comes nearest to it. What a lovely description. Uh, and then, as I say, he's not quite, they're not quite at the Arctic Circle. So on the 21st of December, 1822, the longest night, uh, they're not quite, the sun does come up, but uh, not, <laughs> it just pokes its head above the horizon for a few minutes. And Archer, as they said, was discernible to the naked eye until 47 minutes after 11 a.m., 13 minutes before midday, you could still see Arcturus, but half past noon, it was again visible. So uh, the, uh, in the, uh, at three quarters past one o'clock, stars of the second thing, they could you, do, be distinguished. It wasn't quite 24 hours of darkness, but it was all but. You could see Arcturus for all but about 45 minutes or so. Uh, and then, then you get these amazing effects. You get these wonderful mirage type effects in the in the far north uh, because of the uh, because of the inversion layers, the various layers of the atmosphere. Particularly, you've got the nice still weather uh, and an inverted image of the moon, uh, and uh, uh, and either above it or below it. Uh, I'm not quite sure which one it is. The inverted image of the moon below and nearly touching that limit luminary. So it's an inferior mirage of the moon. And uh, and and very neat. Now, Mr. Scallon told me the image had at first been as distinct as the moon itself, and was nearly so when I saw it. That must have been quite a sight. Uh, and then halo displays, as I was saying, you get the beautiful parhelia, sun dogs, 22 degrees either side of the sun. Uh, and then as you get more and more ice around, they get ice crystal effects, refraction of light through ice crystals. Uh, and the most noticeable effect, which uh, you can see many times from, from Britain quite easily, sun dogs are very, very obvious. And then quite often you get this 22 degree halo around the sun, a white circle of light around the sun. Uh, and then when you, uh, if you've got a particularly good display further out, 46 degrees away from the sun, which is the center of this diagram, you get another ice crystal display, uh, 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 another halo. Uh, and then sometimes you get an arc to the top, uh, just touching the, uh, uh, the, uh, the top of the 22 degree halo. Uh, and unfortunately it's not on this one, but in the perfect circumstances, what you get is another arc on the top of it. There you go. Uh, this is that was taken at the South Pole. Uh, the, the the chap, who, who, well, uh, whoever it is, is there is standing in the front of the sun deliberately, so to block out the sun, so you can see all these these effects. So you see the 22 degree uh, uh, halo there with that very sharp edge and then diffusing outwards. You see the parhelia, the two sun dogs, either side of the uh, of the sun blocker. Uh, you see the light, the circum, and it's not a circum horizontal arc, is it? But it's a, uh, it's reflections of ice crystals uh, all the way around the horizon. And then you see that, ta ta that tangential arc at the top, but on the top of that is one further arc that you sometimes see for, uh, on that tangential arc, and that is called the Parry arc. And the reason for that was the first person to describe it was William Parry on his earlier expedition. Uh, this is actually the, the reason that I knew about Parry because I'm, I'm interested in these sort of these ice crystal effects. Uh, and I knew of the Parry arc, and I knew it was named after William Parry, Arctic explorer. Uh, uh, and uh, when I realised that Fisher was the uh, was the uh, astronomer who was on his expedition, I, I, I hope very much that this was the expedition on which the Parry arc had been first described. But unfortunately, it wasn't. It was uh, uh, the, the the previous expedition when William Parry described this effect. And what's going on? All these effects are due to ice crystals which have hexagonal 
uh, symmetry uh, and so you they, there are essentially two main types uh, you get flat plate like uh, hexagonals like sort of beer mats as it were and then you get long pencil like uh, ice crystals uh, you know, like grass cuttings or something like that and depending on the wind and so on uh, how flat these are uh, they, the, the sun can get refracted through them and it's this refraction that causes all these various halos uh, and uh, for, to get the periarch what you need is uh, is uh, is pencil-like crystals uh, that are uh, where the thick conditions are so still that not only are they uh, horizontally aligned, but the bottom uh, face of the of the crystal is actually bot uh, aligned as well. It's not spinning in any sense like that. When you get this this very uh, precise uh, orientation of all the ice crystals because the uh, because the atmospheric uh, uh, stability, then you get this extra arc, the parry arc, and you see it changes with the uh, with the uh, uh, altitude of the sun above the uh, uh, above the horizon. You don't get it below 10 degrees, and uh, uh, but you, between 0 and 10 degrees, you get a, another variety of of parry arc, which is almost like V shaped, and then 10 degrees that V tends to disappear, and you get the parry arc that I've just described. The uh, in, in the opposite way around uh, that becomes more and more dominant the higher above the horizon that the sun is uh, and uh, if you want to know more about this i would recommend les cowley's fantastic at optics atmospheric optics at optics.co.uk that talks about all these things really really fascinating stuff and uh, i give lectures on uh, on on this these sorts of things i, I find them absolutely fascinating um, yeah, there's the guy called Richard Slecht, uh, an American artist, produces illustrations for National Geographic, and so he's perfect for uh, illustrating things where they didn't have cameras, uh, and he imagines himself into some of these expeditions, and he produced several paintings based on this very expedition, and I find them extremely atmospheric. Again, Marty Stein pointed me in the direction of, uh, of Richard Slecht's paintings, absolutely beautiful, and the, the idea, you realise just how tenuous their existence was, that, uh, you know, they had they were in rowing boats essentially towing a boat out of pack ice extraordinary uh, and even more so that they actually had to saw their way out to the open uh, to the open sea it was uh, they they deliberately beached themselves as far into a bay as possible so that they were protected from the arctic gales but that meant when they when the water started clearing in the spring uh, they it, it would be some time before it got to the to the seashore so to get a, a, an early start they actually had to cut their way out with large saws and I, I I find it absolutely fascinating. And then, you know, pull pull the boat out along the channel that they'd cut with their with their bare hands, tugging it as a sort of tug of war to build a pretty substantial pretty substantial ship, pull it out to sea. Uh, I'm I'm full of admiration for these people, extraordinary people, extraordinary expedition. Uh, I, I should finish by saying about the, the expedition itself was that uh, they, uh, uh, they, um, uh, they they found the Strait of the Fuhr in Hecla and they tried to go through it. I mean, that was the idea was to uh, ideally end up in Hawaii or, uh, you know, to the, the west coast of America. Uh, but unfortunately, the current was strong and it was blocked by ice all the year round. And these boats were really not built for ice breaking. Uh, so it took the later expeditions to break their way through the Strait of Fury and Hecla and for the next stage in trying to find if there was a way through around the top of Canada and Alaska to find the, to, 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 to the to Bering Straits and then down into the, the Pacific Ocean. We now know there is, but they, 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 these were the people who were trying to find out. So the expedition uh, was was attracted great public interest. It, you know the sort of the, the sort of uh, 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 the sort of thing that uh, Scotts and uh, and Shackleton's expeditions to the South Pole attracted eighty or ninety years later. Commemorative souvenirs were sold. I quite like this one because it's got a picture of the Fury and Heckler in the middle of it, uh, and you know the, and the various uh, uh, the various the Inuits and some of the native animals. But if you look around the outside, it's got lions and antelopes and so on. So I suspect they repurposed some of their African crockery that had uh, uh, not sold so well and uh, hastily repainted the middle to turn it into into Arctic scenes and uh, I think doing their best with the uh, with excess stock from from previous uh, previous issues uh, but they say it was it was regarded as a success and many of the people on board the boat uh, were uh, awarded the Arctic medal including Reverend George Fisher so he was a recipient of the Arctic medal and that is the center one there you remember me telling you about the fire office uh, that oh, a fire office is interesting enough in some ways the more fascinating but the Arctic 
Olympic medal is not something you got lightly. You you go up to the, the up to the far north and you spend several years there and go places that uh, boldly go where no uh, no European has gone before to actually earn this. So uh, it's a, a, a very prestigious medal, well earned by Fisher. Um, so he, uh, he, he, that was his last Arctic expedition of the, of the two he went on. Uh, but uh, on his return, this, this essentially made his scientific career. He did well. He, he, uh, he did well in his astronomical observations. He did well in his scientific uh, 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 observations and the, you know, the liquefaction of gases, magnetic dip and so on. So he was elected to the Royal Society on his return, served on its council. So he was very well regarded until his retirement in 1863. Vice president several times, though never actually the president and elected to the upstart of the Royal Astronomical Society, just founded seven years previously. He was elected to them as well in 1827. The RAS essentially was founded because they didn't think the Royal Society was representing the astronomers well enough. So William Pearson felt that and, and organized his own society. But they, 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 they got up fairly well. Uh, so his next job was to join HMS Sparshit carrying out magnetic observations. You don't just want magnetic observations in the high latitudes, even though that's an interesting place to be close to the magnetic pole. You want to find out what the magnetic dip is at all sorts of places. And he carried out magnetic observations in the Mediterranean and then from HMS Hero in the West Indies. And he gave papers to the Royal Society on, on magnetic variations. Uh, and then the end of his Royal Naval career, as, as many people, I think, his final naval posting was to HMS Victory, which then, as now, I mean, it was only uh, only uh, uh, 20 years or so after uh, after the Battle of Trafalgar, no, 30 years or so, it was 1805, wasn't it, Trafalgar, uh, was a, a, a HMS Victory uh, was in dry dock by that point, as it remains to this day. And I think it's something of an honorary posting. Uh, I, I mean, I've been to HMS Victory and, uh, you know, it, it is still a commissioned ship of the Royal Navy, even though it's not seen water in, uh, in well over, uh, well well over a century and a half now. Uh, it, 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 it been retired rather less time in, in Fisher's day, but it was still somewhere, I think, that you went for your last posting when you were, didn't, didn't want to go to sea anymore, or some, something, of a, something of a cushy number to uh, be on HMS Victory. So uh, you retired quite early from the Navy because it was uh, quite harsh conditions at sea, particularly when you're up in the high Arctic. Uh, so his, he was offered a couple of possible posts. He was offered, uh, uh, being a reverend, uh, a living up in Northumberland, uh, which I think might have been quite nice, but instead he chose to become the headmaster and the chaplain of the Greenwich Hospital School in, in Greenwich itself in London, which originally founded as a school to teach navigation to the sons and, uh, and indeed uh, uh, to the orphan sons of of, of Royal Naval personnel, keep keep them in the trade, as it were. Uh, if if you were if you've been on a boat and you had kids, you probably want your, you might want your sons to go to sea. So you want to send them to a school where they teach you basic navigational principles. Uh, and this was housed in what is now the National Maritime Museum. That's where the buildings were originally for. And he was at the school, as you can see, for the second half of his career, 1834 through to 1863, as headmaster. Although it's quite interesting, the histories of the school say what well, he was the headmaster uh, and. Then uh, 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 you have to search quite uh, quite closely to find out that in uh, 1840 there were complaints that he's neglecting his chaplaincy, uh, so he had to choose either be the chaplain or be the headmaster. You haven't got time to do both, uh, and he chose to become the chaplain instead. So he was only really headmaster for six years, but in that time he introduced quite modern teaching methods, modern uh, well, including test results, taking examinations, and so on. I'm not sure whether or not he was the first in the country to do that, but he he was clearly uh, uh, was uh, was some but he wanted to innovate and try different things. Uh, and so, uh, you know, yeah, I think he was quite a progressive teacher in that respect. And he also built an observatory at the school. I'd love to know more about this, but the internet is not a great place to search for it because if you put Greenwich Observatory into, into Google, you get a different observatory for pretty obvious reasons. So uh, I, I've read various books, but I've never really got quite to the bottom just exactly what the observatory was. Uh, but I, 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 I've read his papers, I went down to Greenwich for the day. Um, I was, uh, uh, <laughs> Quite fascinating in, in a pandemic. I had to fill in all sorts of forms and so on, and uh, uh, and uh, agree to to various things and order everything in advance. And I got there, and they said, "Oh, Mr. Frost, hello." And I was pretty much the only person who was there that day. I think uh, not many people were studying, but I was reading through various of his papers. Uh, and uh, it, it, when he was at um, uh, at the school, he carried on rating chronometers. He'd have a collection of uh, of chronometers in his rooms in the school. Uh, obviously, uh, what you really need to do is take them to see, but you can rate. 
fight them in, in, in a room on land as a landlubber and see how fast they go relative to each other. So it's a good start. It's probably not the acid test that you wanted to. But he, his notebooks contain various longitude calculations of various observatories. The Hotwell Observatory up in Buckinghamshire, run by Dr. John Lee, which was quite the centre of uh, lunar observation in Britain at, at this period. Uh, the Professor Rumker's observatory in Hamburg. Uh, but perhaps the most interesting one is, is a longitude calculation for the Grand Bahamas. You remember he was on uh, HMS uh, uh, Hero in, in the West Indies, and he observed an eclipse, and he's trying to calculate the altitude from uh, the, the, the longitude of the Grand Bahamas from the altitude of the sun during an eclipse. And uh, it's a complicated calculation, and I'm not swearing to the method, but I suspect what he's doing is figuring out what, how far above the, the, the horizon the sun was at a particular time of the eclipse, you know, the second contact when totality begins or third contact when it ends uh, and the, it, from that if you measure the altitude very carefully hopefully you would be able to figure out where on the eclipse track you are i think that was the method he was using there are talks about observing a meteor uh, there's a little notice of a very bright meteor he saw but most interesting of all perhaps is his thoughts on aurora quite a long paper he submitted to the Royal uh, Royal Society. Uh, I mean, you don't have to read all of it, but uh, just, a, just, a, just a, a, a couple of highlights from it. He, con he conceives, that's Fisher, is produced in situations where vapors of a humid atmosphere are undergoing rapid congelation. It's interesting that uh, uh, you, you were talking earlier about uh, Aurora on Saturn and, and going back to the original meaning of, uh, of Aurora as being winds. Well, I think uh, Fisher would have agreed with you that it, he thought it was something in the atmosphere, that it's something that, uh, that is going on. He, he thinks it's more to do, however, with the uh, uh, with the, what's happening on the, the the boundary between the pack ice and the sea, uh, it's seen fringing the upper borders of dark clouds, termed sea blink, collected over these places. So he thinks it's a meteorological phenomenon, and he's not alone in that. I think a lot of people thought that. He concludes the aurora borealis is an electrical phenomenon. Well, that's a that's a perceptive arising from the positive electricity of the atmosphere developed by the rapid compensation of the vapor in the act of freezing. So you give it got a given mark. He realized essentially it was something to do with electricity. They didn't know enough about electricity to be able to say much more than that. Uh, but what he thought was that it was quite localized and it was quite low in the atmosphere and that it was due to clouds and the different temperatures between uh, uh, between uh, uh, the sea and the land. And in that is completely wrong. I think he would have been absolutely straight. He would have been gobsmacked to find out how high in the atmosphere the aurora are i mean he's thinking i think in terms of you know hundreds of hundreds of yards above the above the sea when in fact they're at, at, at dozens of kilometers 80 kilometers or so high uh, he would have been you know gobsmacked further to find that the aurora actually form an oval around the north uh, around the, the magnetic poles that they go on for hundreds and hundreds of miles not following the boundary with the pack ice uh, and he I, and, and i i think he would have found it difficult to believe uh, that uh, that quite often you get a correlation when there's a good aurora storm in the northern hemisphere you'll also get a good auroral storm in the southern hemisphere that is difficult to explain in terms of sea blink and pack ice uh, because it's nothing to do with those two uh, as we now know it's to do with solar weather it's to do with a solar wind leaving the sun uh, fisher had no idea about that and i suspect he would have been uh, he would have been fascinated to find out what the real exp explanation was uh, it's interesting why he might have come up with this and i suspect it's because he was he spent he observed most of his aurora from uh, from a ship that was uh, that was uh, uh, parked in the pack ice to the north of the aurora borealis to the north of the auroral oval so most of the aurora he's seen would have been south of the boat and uh, and uh, he can easily mistake them as taking place near the the, the boundary of the ocean so uh, it's fascinating stuff from the school still doing astronomy uh, but uh, one one last thing that was he recorded from the observatory was that the eclipse of 1860 it was, a, it was a deep partial eclipse from England, but it was total across Spain. Uh, and so Fisher observed submitted observations from Greenwich School. They're mostly technical observations of the altitude of the sun rather than uh, the uh, descriptions of the eclipse itself. Uh, and then uh, 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 he submitted them to the uh, monthly notice of the Royal Astronomical Society, along with a lot of other people, including William Rutter Dawes, the great observational astronomer, and Captain William Noble, first president of the British Astronomical Association. But the most interesting observations, of course, were of the total eclipse uh, from Spain. And one of the people who observed that was James Morris Wilson, a master at rugby school for, uh, in, in, in where I live. Uh, and there were all these various drawings of the 1860 eclipse. 
which are you know a, 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 we're coming out to somebody who's seen a lot of eclipses you, 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 they're grasping at the at the features of the solar corona but if what you notice there on a lot of them is that bulge towards the bottom right hand corner at around about four o'clock uh, various people draw some people draw it some people don't wilson you can see draws it uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, in the middle left there that shows there's something there and what it was was a we think we can't be absolutely certain was a coronal mass ejection a, a, an explosion large explosion from the sun which was caught during totality uh, now this is a pretty rare event to, to see during totality. Coronal mass ejections are not uh, are not particularly infrequent. Uh, uh, Lynn, Lynn, I'm sure will will uh, will give us the detail on it. But my understanding is yes, they occur about once every three days, and they take about two hours or so to clear the solar corona. So that's about a one in thirty six chance of there being a uh, coronal mass ejection in progress during the total eclipse. However, you're not going to see all of them uh, because uh, if if the if the coronal mass ejection is on the other side of the sun, you're not going to see it uh, because the sun's in the way and the moon is in the way uh, and if it's directly towards you you're not going to see it because the moon is in the way it's covering the sun so it needs to be off to the side as it were so uh, perhaps one in 72 total eclipses you might see a coronal mass ejection in progress and total eclipses occur about once every 18 months about one in a year so it's about once a century or thereabouts that you'll see a coronal mass ejection in progress during a total eclipse of the sun so uh, where well, the question is it's in 1860 has been 160 years is uh, uh, have there been any others why yes there has been one other and it was the one I went to see in Patagonia in 2020. And if we see this absolutely fantastic picture by Andreas Moller, uh, developed uh, by uh, uh, by uh, Miroslav Druckmuller, didn't see the eclipse, but it's, it's, it's capable of analyzing these pictures. This was on the front cover of the BAA journal with Andreas's permission. This is, I think this is quite possibly the best picture ever taken of a total eclipse. Uh, you can, uh, he's, uh, Miroslav has analyzed and brought out all sorts of detail, like uh, what you can see on the, on the near side of the the moon, uh, which is it, it's dark to the naked eye, but you can see that there is detail there with uh, illuminated by earth shine, which you can bring out if you analyze care carefully. You see the prominences on the sun. You see the polar brushes emanating from the north and the south pole of the sun. You can see the corona and these beautiful streamers off at one o'clock and two o'clock and four o'clock and five o'clock. But what really grabs the attention is that loop there, they, that coronal mass ejection. And uh, not so obvious to the naked eye, I, I have to say, but uh, the pictures of it do it justice. And it's uh, and actually, I haven't put this in this account, uh, but you can see it moving in between images taken in Patagonia and central Patagonia and on the Argentinian coast. So um, there have been two recorded solar eclipses uh, which, uh, with which there are coronal mass ejections in progress. And there's been an astronomer from rugby at both of them. Yeah. Um, anyway, so he's uh, 1860 is almost his last hurrah as an observer uh, 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 from, sorry, as uh, at Greenwich at the, uh, at the observatory there, and he retires in 1863. Let me tell you a little bit about his family. He married Elizabeth Alicia Wisnum, 1838, but she didn't last that long. She died in 1846. They had two daughters, Alice and Elizabeth, both of whom I shall mention shortly, and a son, George, about whom I know nothing, which might be because he died young, as they tended to do in the uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the, the Victorian era. His elder brother, uh, well, I, I, um, I'll tell you about the other one. But the el his eldest brother, James Hurtle Fisher, is quite a significant figure. He he, he uh, emigrated to Australia and helped to establish the South Australia colony based on Adelaide, uh, for which he was knighted as the first person from the Australian colonies to be knighted. So it's quite a significant figure. And indeed, there is a square named after him in Adelaide. I've been to Adelaide and I don't remember it. It's called Hurtle Square, and it's not because the traffic hurtles around it. It's named after Sir James Hurtle Fisher. So it, I, I, you know, the family were quite accomplished in all sorts of unexpected directions. Uh, but uh, the other brother, who may well have been uh, George's twin, because they, 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 they are, we're not sure the exact dates of birth, but uh, would make sense, he moved to Market Harbour and he founded a surveying company. And that is still going. It was the Fisher Company and then it merged with another one. It's Fisher German, who are actually land agents for, uh, they, they sell, I, I think, agricultural properties and so on right across the country. So they're, they're a quite substantial organization. And that is how uh, Bob Hakewell, the, the history man, came to know about the Fisher family. He was researching the history of this company and, and discovered all sorts of extraordinary people, Hanover Square, 
Hurtle Square in Adelaide, uh, the, uh, and, uh, and the astronomer. Uh, so uh, quite why um, uh, George ended up in rugby, we're not really sure. But he had a brother who lived in Market Harbour. His wife actually died in Market Harbour, uh, you know, uh, perhaps visiting the in-laws, as it were. And so perhaps he moved to rugby to be closer to his brother during his retirement. Uh, but just, there's just a suspicion um, that... Um, uh, you remember this is the the, uh, the the house I showed is actually this is very close to rugby school and to rugby observatory. Uh, he lived less than 200 meters from rugby school's temple observatory. James Morris Wilson, as we've seen, was a, a, a very accomplished astronomer. He observed from the school, but he had a, a pupil, a very uh, a, a accomplished uh, chap who was uh, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he was mentored by James Morris Wilson when he was a schoolboy at, uh, uh, at, uh, at rugby school. He then went away and qualified as a solicitor, but then moved back to rugby uh, and uh, established an, a fully 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 uh, equipped observatory at the school, originally with Wilson, but eventually just Seabrook. Seabrook was an extremely accomplished observer, BAA president 1900 to 1902, uh, the director of various of the, of, the, of the sections of the British Astronomical Association. So is it possible, and the Temple Observatory was built in 1870, uh, um, uh, uh, Fisher moved into rugby in 1863, lived there for 10 years, is it possible that Fisher observed with Wilson or Seabrook? And I'll be honest, I don't know the answer to that one. I suspect the answer is no, because by 1870, it's only two or three years before he died. So he was getting on. But it'd be lovely. I, I, I really need to research George Seabrook, an extraordinary character who, uh, who uh, deserves uh, more research on, on my part. Uh, the, the, the observatory is still there. Uh, Rugby School have an astronomical society called the Seabrook Society in, uh, in, in honor of, of George Mitchell Seabrook. So he is somebody who really deserves uh, some more of my attention. And I hope I'll find some observing notebooks that prove that George Fisher did some observing with him at least, or uh, came to visit the observatory or something like that. Okay, the daughter. Uh, this was the real surprise of my research that uh, I'm, I'm going along. I find all these things about George Fisher. Uh, and, uh, uh, and amongst them is the fact that George Fisher was a quite substantial figure uh, and was in the dish Dictionary of National Biography, for example. You, know, you don't get into that unless you've accomplished things. Well, he wasn't the only person in 11 Hill Morton Road to have an entry in the Dictionary of National Biography. So did his daughter. I, I'm thinking that his dutiful daughter looks after him in his, in his, uh, in his, in his decline years and that may well have been the case I'm, I'm sure it was for the father she'd, uh, she'd keep an eye on him but at the same time she was a novelist she was writing novels um, and uh, and so uh, oh, sorry uh, there's one 1873 the year of, uh, of uh, Fisher's death but of course he, she'd be writing it in the years beforehand and then his queen a novel in three parts uh, I have read Too Bright to Last so you don't have to. Um, it's it's a classic uh, Victorian melodrama. Um, it's not J Jane Austen, uh, uh, and it's definitely not George Eliot, who uh, who uh, grew up in uh, in Nuneaton, which is not very far from here, uh, but had moved to London. She wasn't uh, uh, wasn't a friend of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, uh, Alice Fisher. Uh, it's. <laughs> I, it is not. It is not the uh, uh, the most important of novels from the from the Victorian. It's readable. Uh, it's but it is it is very much a melodrama, and, it, and uh, it's the story of a uh, of a uh, uh, of a beautiful lady from uh, from. Uh, 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 I'm going to say well to do, but they're not a, a, a family of limited means in London, who instead of marrying for wealth, marries a handsome uh, hill farmer from Brecon in, uh, in, in Wales. Uh, and if there's any sort of deeper theme to it, it is this sort of class, is that uh, should you marry for love or should you marry to, uh, to, uh, uh, to enhance your family? Uh, but having said that, it's, it's <laughs> the, the end of the, uh, sorry, spoiler alert, turn, turn, turn me off if you don't want to know any more, but the last chapter, uh, she, uh, she starts off and she's come back to London and uh, she's not feeling tremendously well, but she just time to tell off her other suitor uh, before catching consumption and dying in her lover's arms, all in all in the space of about twelve hours, all in uh, uh, all in all in uh, a dinner party in London. It's uh, I, I found it quite amusing in the end. There are bits of it that are set in Greenwich. Uh, there's quite a a, a climactic um, uh, 
quite a, an important part of the middle of the novel, which is a day trip down to Greenwich, which of course both Alice and uh, and George Fisher would know. I haven't had the strength to read three part novel, his Queen, a novel. I don't know what what that's going to be like. Uh, too bright to last. It's okay. It's not great. So having had a reasonably successful career as a novelist, uh, her father has, has gone, so she's free to travel as she wants, and she chooses to take up the career of nursing. Very, very successfully, very short, but very stellar career. Pretty much immediately, she became superintendent nurse at Adam Brooks in Cambridge, uh, in Birmingham at the Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. And her mentor was none other than Florence Nightingale. And uh, they uh, uh, they're apparently haven't read it, but the British Library has correspondence between Alice Fisher and, and Florence Nightingale. I don't think they've got Alice Fisher's letters, but not Florence Nightingale's replies. So she was somebody at the top of, uh, of English nursing. And then she emigrated to America. Uh, to be emigrated to the United States to become superintendent of the Philadelphia Hospital. She wrote an article on nursing in America, which is quite entertaining. It says, uh, if, you were, if, you are, uh, if you don't like nursing in Britain, don't come to America because you won't like nursing in America either. If, on the other hand, you love nursing, well, come to America because we need you here. Uh, uh, she didn't last very long there, uh, but uh, died in 1888, but she established nursing at the Philadelphia Hospital. And the, the nurses of Philadelphia, every year, they walk to her grave in, in typical Victorian garb and lay flowers on her grave. So clearly she made a big impression on, on, on Philadelphia. So uh, uh, extraordinary career. She didn't last that long, but uh, uh, considering uh, you know, she, she, she had two very successful separate careers. Um, so his retirement to, to rugby, uh, he didn't do, as I said, didn't do very much astronomy as far as I can see. There was one paper he wrote, a chapter of a Riddle's Navigation, which was the textbook for, for navigation in the Victorian era. Uh, circular arc serving, which uh, I've read and turns out to be how to plot courses, avoid sailing to high latitudes, even if the Great Circle takes you to that point. Uh, for example, if you're going from Cape Town to Van Diemen's Land or Tasmania, the Great Circle route takes you deep into southern waters where you're going to hit icebergs and the, the roaring 40s and so on. So he suggests techniques to avoid. You, say, you, you sail the Great Circle till you get to a certain latitude and then you just sail east instead. It's a longer journey but it'll get you to a lot less trouble. So that was his last piece of astronomy. Died in 1873 and then as I've indicated he was buried in Little Bowden, the home of his brother, and they have there, there's the church where he's buried and there's a memorial to him there. Uh, you, you might not be able to see. To the loving, to the Glory of God, loving memory of the Reverend George Fisher, MA, fellow of the Royal Society, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, sometime Vice President of the Royal Society, font placed by his other daughter, uh, not write any novels or anything like that, wife of the Reverend C. Darnell, MA of Cargill Field, Edinburgh. I suspect the Reverend C. Darnell put up most of the money for the plaque, so he knots his name on it as well, July 1885. So I, uh, he's, Fisher was you know, a, a man of his era. He didn't, uh, he, he was. He, well, there are things that are, are quite impressive. Uh, discovering the liquefaction of gases is, is, is great. He's, as often with lots of people I said in the Victorian era, his big ideas are wrong. He misunderstood the aurora, although some bits of it he did, he was quite perceptive on. Uh, but what you should remember him, I think of, well, as a schoolmaster, somebody who, uh, who, uh, who, who, who brought the notes, arts and navigation to the, uh, uh, to, to the, uh, to the children of the Navy. Uh, but I think primarily as the Arctic astronomer who accompanied William Parry on that great expedition to find the Northwest Passage. So thank you very much for listening to me. That, that was really good. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it was. It was, it was fascinating. It was brilliant. Brilliant. Hi. Yeah. And I never tire of seeing those images of the eclipse. They're absolutely fantastic. Uh, aren't they just, yeah. They oh, just... yeah. I mean, and to get a coronal mass ejection you know, at the same time is like the cherry on the cake, isn't it? <laughs> The, the, well, our, our trip to Patagonia was just just amazing for so many respects, and you think a coronal mass ejection in progress, and then they oh. look back to see if there are any more, and there's there's the one in 1860, which a whole lot of people saw. Wonderful. Uh, it's so rare to catch. I mean, I'm at the telescope a lot, obviously doing the solar work, and I very very rarely, you know, catch a coronal mass ejection, you know, actually happening. So it is sheer luck. I think I've only caught a couple in all these years, you know.
you've worked very hard on this, Mike, and it's shown through time after time. Thank you. I th when I get my teeth into something like this, you know, you've got to, you've got to find out everything about these guys. They were, uh, they were. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's I, I introduced it, I gave it to my local society and I said this is what I did in my lockdown there's all the, the researching and writing up the paper and so on well I've got to go folks so bye for now yep bye for now bye bye, bye. bye Bob right. take Bob. care because right. I, I looked up on Amazon that time case I forgot so as I had it on my uh, on on my um bookmark thing that um the strangest man man book so on Paul Dirac yeah very 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 recommended Dirac was Hi. the I, 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 I like Isaac Newton. I think uh, Graham Fellows thinks that there was some uh, autism there. He had difficulty you know, interacting with other human beings, and um, but that might have been what gave him the edge. You know, they, they say we said about Isaac Newton is he could concentrate and he could concentrate and he could concentrate. I, su I suspect Dirac was the same. But uh, and then fast. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm giving away some of the stories. But uh, he uh, he um, he was just a scientist, very very fixed. Uh, no, no interest in relationships at all until his friend uh, Eugene Wigner died uh, and he married the widow, uh, whom he always introduced to everybody as Wigner's widow rather than by her real, by her first name, uh, right. and uh, went on to you know, have children with her and have a, a, a perfectly normal you know, family life. It seemed as though he, you know, I, again, I, I think a lot of, sort of physicists, the uh, concentration is there and then you get to a certain age and, you know, you want to, you want to get on with a normal life, as it were. But it, it is really great read. And, uh, you know, Dirac's not that well known and he really deserves to be. He was an extraordinary character. Aye, uh, because I've got a couple of Dirac books, so it'd be interesting to have this. And I got uh, a voucher from my brother and he, his wife and daughter um, for my, my birthday in, in January there. So I've not spent it yet. So I was looking to see what I could get from Amazon. So that is one thing I'll be buying because it's, it's £10.65. So that's not bad, you know? Yeah, very worth reading. Aye. Mm -hmm. Right. Dirac, D I R A C, yeah? Yeah, I don't yeah. know how to spell it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, by, almost by default, you think he must be Swiss or French or something like that with a name. And I think he's, uh, I think he's Huguenot ancestry. But, you know, he, he spoke with a, a West Country Burr, you know, who's very, very much a Bristolian. Mm -hmm. any, any questions? Anybody got any questions or okay. on mic? Can we get? Oh, we can you switch the camera? Absolutely fascinating. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've read several books on Arctic. Uh, Arctic, Arctic explorations in the, in the, in the past, and uh, it was fantastic. Yeah, but you're full of admiration, aren't you? They, they, these were they, these were people who were, you know, some of them didn't come back. <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah. you're lucky to come back when you see what happened to others. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and and some people on the you know the Parry Fisher expedition, there were casualties. There, people died. You know, it's uh, there's not not a, even even on a successful expedition, they still lost people, and I, we tend to forget that these days. You know, so it's almost not quite risk averse, but uh, you know, things were dangerous. Hmm. I mean, certainly were. <laughs> I mean, they were an amazing, an amazing bunch. You know back in the Victorian era, I mean, they just seemed to be quite hardy and just um, go for it and find find out stuff and uh, you know, and go to these uh, far-flung places, not knowing what, the, what or who they were going to meet. Yeah, 
I, I mean, the, the idea, you have no idea what's next. No, I know. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, these days you can go anywhere on earth with Google Maps and you know, just look, mm. look down on it. But those days, uh, yeah, it, literally, it was terra, terra, terra nullius, wasn't it? Un, unknown land. Right. Mm. Yep. Right. And I mean, you were, they were meeting, as you said, they met, they met the Eskimos and that, the Inuits and that. And I mean, they, they didn't know if they, if they were friendly or what they were going to, what I, they were I, going to do. I get the impression that on the, on the very margins, you have to be cooperative. You can't you can't afford to fall out with people. You know, that's it. it just just doesn't work. Yeah, you know, if you fight a war against the next people along, then both lots die because you know, you have you have to cooperate to live. Aye, because I mean, every person you meet, they met along the way, would help them stay alive to get back home. Yeah, you know, and provide I, them with food, etc., supplies, or whatever they needed. Yeah, and I think that you know they, again the 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 Inuit, the Inuit weren't stupid. They realised you know, they Aye. on board the boat were lots of things that be really useful to them, and uh, the, they had things that were really useful to the boat. So you do, you know, you, you do the best the basic trade, and it benefits, mm -hmm. benefits both sides. Yep. No, oh, it was really interesting. Right? Is there any other questions? Is there any questions for me? <laughs> Mm, no, don't. I think everybody's just trying to take all the information <laughs> in because, you know, the it's it was very as it, Bill Gray says it was very comprehensive. You know, very comprehensive and thoroughly researched. <coughs> uh, yeah. Talk. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it was very interesting. And, and that's fascinating, man. So. I'd like to thank you so much for your fascinating talk about the Reverend George Fisher and the fascinating people he met on his adventures to the Arctic, especially the interactions with the Eskimos. The crew, of course, like most sailors and non-sailors, were a hardy bunch, particularly coping with the Arctic conditions. I would like us to thank Mike in the usual cas we. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.